So uh, this second panel is talking about forums where uh, these issues arise. We're no longer just talking about reproductive rights. We're talking about places where women's equality, sometimes uh, mostly uh, in terms of legal rights, but I want to just remind people how wide the number of forums that we are addressing, or at least out there, I don't know how many of the panelists will address all of them, but of course, you've already heard mention of CEDAW. Uh, CEDAW is a typical uh, treaty body, uh, one of, I believe, 10 uh, under the global human rights uh, treaties that the UN has. And like many of the other treaty bodies, it uh, pronounces its views. Um, it calls it, and many others do, its jurisprudence of the interpretation of the CEDAW Convention through uh, responses to state reports, its concluding observations to state reports, its uh, views in response to individual communications, and that occurs when the members of, uh, of the ratified convention have also adopted the optional protocol that permits that. Uh, and also, and, and to my mind most usefully, through its general recommendations. It also has the capacity, and not all of them of the treaty bodies do, to report on inquiries. And that's the jurisprudence that many people talk about when we talk about the human rights jurisprudence of treaties. Uh, but keep in mind that the issues about parity, uh, the gender parity, questions of women's equality come up in virtually all the UN human rights treaties because almost all of them, except two, I think, refugees and third, the racial discrimination, uh, include a prohibition on sex discrimination. And that includes the covenant on civil and political rights, the co covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, and that whole body is places where advocates, which will be our third uh, panel, transnational civil society is active. But keep in mind, there is a goal five of the sustainable development goals, gender equality. So that's a place where these issues get discussed. There is the World Bank's gender equality, otherwise known as economic empowerment initiatives. There are regional human rights courts that also discuss these issues. We've just heard the WHO for instance, so other international organizations. You will also, I suspect, hear of the peace and security agenda uh, within the UN Security Council, uh, where uh, issues of that, uh, of, of uh, women's position, principally in conflict, but perhaps more than in conflict, uh, are occasionally raised. And of course, it's that body, as well as the UN generally, that has raised the issue of gender mainstreaming across the UN system and whether that has or has not played a role. We will start our discussion through a pre-recorded video uh, by Masuko Mori, who's a special advisor to the Japanese prime minister, and she is in charge of women's empowerment. She's also a lawyer, three-term member of the House of Counselors in the Diet, the upper house of Japan's parliament, and before her current position in government, she held other senior positions, including minister in charge of support for women's empowerment, child rearing, and also the minister of justice. She has held leadership positions in the House of Counselors and in the ruling Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. And she was closely involved in uh, re reconstruction recovery efforts in the wake of the Japanese uh, earthquake. She holds a law degree from uh, Tokohoto uh, University was a visiting fellow here at NYU. And in fact, she visited just recently in uh, Bruce Aronson's class. And I hope some of your class uh, uh, ends up uh, coming here, Bruce. But in any case, uh, if we can roll the tape. Uh, konnichiwa. Uh, Naikaku Sori Daijin Hosakan no uh, Mori Masako de Gozaimasu, Sanin Gin de. 内閣総理大臣補佐官としての担当は女性活躍でございます。え、本日日本における女性施策の成果とこれから必要と考える取り組みについて 
ご質問をいただきました、えー、特に国際法律規範が与えた影響や最新のグローバルジェンダーギャップ指数ということそれから働く女性が男性と同様の力を得ることを妨げている要因についても触れつつご説明いただきたいというご質問をいただきましたので今からお答えをさせていただきますそれでは今からスタートいたします皆様こんにちは本日はギャレットカンファレンスにおける国際法と国際規範の役割をテーマとするパネルにおいてお話をする機会を賜り感謝申し上げますこれまでの日本における男女共同参画の歴史的な歩みを振り返れば1975年国連が開催した国際婦人年連、えー、世界会議において1976年から1985年にわたる国連婦人の10年と世界行動計画が採択されたことをきっかけとして現在日本政府で男女共同参画を担う機関男女共同参画推進本部の基礎が築かれまた女性差別撤廃条約への署名1980年や基準に向けて男女雇用均等法の制定をはじめとする国内法の整備が行われました。まあ、これはは私にとっては、えーだいぶ前のことでございまして、私が大学を卒業する頃あたりの出来事でございました。近年は特にアベノミクスにおける女性活躍政策、いわゆるウィメノミクスの成果、こちらの方が現代日本を生きる女性にとっては、しかし、情報だと思います。まずは、初代の女性活躍担当大臣であった私のもとで10年前に女性活躍推進法を作りました国会での成立は2015年ですここから従業員の女性脱性の採用状況や女性の管理職役員の割合この開示を認めたこのディスクロージャーの法律というのが日本では初めてそして世界的にも珍しい法律でありますがこれを求めたことで企業の情報開示が進みました、まあ、日本企業の特性とも言える法律で決めたらしっかり守るということでこの分野の開示がスピードアップされたわけでございます法律成立に向けた動きは当時私が日本の女性大臣として初めて出席いたしました APEC 女性と経済フォーラムにおいて、えー、声明に盛り込まれるということでアジアでも非常に注目をされた政策です2013年のことでしたまた私のもとで作りましたウィメノミクス3本の矢当時アベノミクス3本の矢がございましたらそれに習ってウィメノミクス3本の矢つまり1つ目の矢が女性本人2つ目の矢が家庭と仕事の両立そして3本目の矢が企業の環境整備です3つに対して大きな予算を割きましたこれによって2012年から2021年の間に女性の就業者数が340万人も増加をいたしましてそれまでずっと世界的に指摘されていた日本の M 字カーブつまり女性就業率の25歳から44歳がですね、えー、結婚や出産で、えー、ガクンと落ち込むということが解消されまして2022年4月時点で女性就業率が 78.6% になり M 字カーブが解消されたわけです、えー、なお現在、えー、15歳から64歳の女性就業率はアメリカを上回っておりますまた出産に関しては日本における周産期の死亡率、妊産婦の死亡率は諸外国と比較して非常に低く、健康が保障され、世界において最も安全なレベルの周産期医療体制を提供しています。出産後の育児に関しても、300万人分以上の保育の受け皿を確保いたしました。これもアベノミクスのウィムノミクスの
の中で作戦として展開していたわけですがあこの保育保育園をどんどん建てていくということと合わせて育児休業で休んだ時のお給料を給付するという制度も世界最高の水準にしましたすなわち給与の最大 67% を支給され給付は非課税で社会保険料も免除されますから実質的には給業前の手取り賃金と比較して実質8割程度の現金が手元に来るということになりますさらに今月の1日から産後パパ育休制度が始まり男性の産休育休の制度も整いました女性のみならず男性の育休を企業の方が取らせることを義務付けるという珍しい法律ですが先ほど言ったように日本の企業の特性に合わせた法律でございますこれにより育休制度の促進が期待されます実際に最近の民間の調査によると妻が大学卒以上の夫婦の子どもの数について2021年 1.74 と19年ぶりに上昇して V 字回復いたしましたつまり出生率の V 字回復が見られたわけです育児と仕事の両立支援により子どもを産む女性を増えたことが影響している可能性があると分析されていますさらに来年2023年の4月には子ども家庭庁が成立発足いたしますので妊娠出産育児と切れ目なく親と子を支援していきますこのようにさまざまな政策を講じて成果を上げてきたというふうに考えておりますがご指摘のとおり日本のジェンダーギャップ指数は世界で116位と非常に低いわけで私も本当に残念なんですけれども特に政治と経済の分野で値が低いということが言われております。男女共同参画は諸外国に比べてまあこういったことで全体の平均定数では遅れていると言えますがこれを測る4つの指数つまり今言った政治と経済が非常に値が低いですが残り2つの教育と健康はですね先ほど言った通り非常に高いトップクラスでありますほとんど1位の点数ですつまり日本の女性は健康で教育水準が高いえつまり高い潜在能力を持った即戦力となる女性が日本の労働人口の半分以上存在するということが言えるわけですこの点に注目をすべきでありますですので今後はこの日本の隠れた資産とある女性をいかに活躍させるかという点が注目されますので岸田総理のもとでこの点に注目した政策を現在展開しておりますつまりどうやってこの女性たちを経済的に自立をさせ日本の経済成長につなぐ結果というところが肝になりますこのため岸田政策の目玉政策である新しい資本主義この中核に女性の経済的自立を位置づけて横断的に女性活躍の基盤を強化することで日本経済社会の多様性を担保し、イノベーションにつなげていくことが重要であるとの考え方を示しました。2022年、今年の6月に、えー、新しい資本主義のガイドラインというところで発表し、新しい資本主義の4つの柱の冒頭部分に女性が中核と書きましたので、4つの柱、すべてに女性活躍が横断的に網羅をされていくという位置づけにいたしました。働く女性たちが男性と変わらず自分らしく輝くことへの障害はなお今も存在しています。それは一つには固定的性別役割分担意識アンコンシャスバイアスの存在です。古くから男性は外で仕事女性は家庭を守る子どもを教育するという慣習からこの意識が生じています。女性も男性もこの意識を変えていくという必要があります。結婚しても子供を持っても自分らしく輝けるそして家庭も平和である、えー、ということを若い人や中間管理職に持ってもらうことが必要です個々人のみでなく企業や組織の意識を変えていかなければなりませんそのためにはさまざまな
間にトップリーダーたちが訴えていくということが必要です。その一つの機会として、本年12月3日に岸田総理のイニシアチブにおいて、国際女性会議、ワウを開催いたします。この会議、私が担当しておりますが、新しい資本主義と女性をメインテーマに据えまして、世界中の女性リーダーや男性リーダーたちと、新しい社会と経済、DV や健康等について活発に議論をいたします。世界100カ国以上から女性閣僚、大統領レベルの皆様がこの東京に集結いたしますので、オンラインでも無料でも参加できますので、ぜひご参加ください。今年は渋沢栄一の元邸宅で行います。アメリカからも素晴らしい登壇者が参加をし、この女性リーダーたちの姿を若い、えー、皆様に、男女に、えー、見てもらうということであの、若い人たちのモデル、それから将来の希望、えー、ダイバーシティが整った日本への希望を見出す機会にしてもらえばと思っています。アメリカの、えー、若い学生たちもオンラインで参加してくれます。このことによって、えー、先日の国連ウィーク、えー、これに開催されたキーホーシーサミットにおいて、えー、チャンピオンに、えー、岸田総理が輝きましたが、その岸田総理からも、えー、授賞式でワウをやりますから、ワウに来てくださいというふうに宣言をされました。えー、さらに、えー、初代の女性活躍担当、総理補佐官、私のこの今、官邸にいる役目は、あ日本で初めての役割、この官邸にいる政治家、女性は私一人だけなんですが、今までゼロだったんですが、やっと私がありました。この初代の女性補佐官の私の下にですね、女性と経済という会議体を作りました。つまり、女性活躍をすることは、女性自身の幸せや人権に資するだけでなく、この国の経済と、えー、国のために役に立つということを理念だけではなく、データでしっかり示していく。といいう会議でございますこの会議にさまざまな知見が今、集積されつつありますので、えー、官邸のホームページ等で、えー、皆様にお見せをするという形で、引き続きさまざまなアプローチを行って、えー、まいります。ご清聴ありがとうございます。So you can see that if、uh, Minister Mori would become Prime Minister of Japan, Uh, that a rating on World Economic、uh, Forum's、uh, gender rating on women in politics would shoot up immediately. She's a very effective politician, from what I understand. So, we have a sterling panel here、uh, with us. Our first book,、uh, speaker will be Basuki i n a s a y a who teaches human rights, legal, and social、uh, theory here at NYU's Gallatin. Where she's also faculty director of the Gallatin Global Fellowship in Human Rights.、Um, she has dozens of,、uh, of books and articles、uh, that very much affect this topic.、Uh, for those of you who follow、uh, trends in scholarship, she is the leader of the Twail Approaches in International、uh, Law. Her current book projects include International Conflict Feminism, forthcoming from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, press, reading the ruins, colonialism, slavery, and international law. And、uh, as a founding member of Twail, she's published a handbook、uh, with other leaders in Twail on third world approaches to international law,、uh, and uh, including uh, articles uh, that she has authored, Feminist Approaches to,、uh, to International Law, forthcoming in a book by Dunoff and Pollack on international legal theory. Uh, she's also participated in, as a core faculty in Harvard Law School's Institute for Global Law and Policy.、Um, I can't even mention the number of advisory editorial committees of journals that she's a part of, including Feminist Legal Studies, Third World Approaches to International Law Review, and many others.、Um, she was, is the first speaker because she's going to do a little historical survey of how we got here, I understand. Off to you. Thank you, Jose, for that、um, very kind introduction and greatly exaggerated、um, uh, backdrop to my own history. <laughs> But I'm now going to speak to,、uh, in some sense, the history、uh, in relation to thinking about、um, 
women's rights at the at the UN uh, and um, sort of international institutions, um, and uh, and speak in some sense very broad brush about um, ab about um, about that period. Um, I have um, you know the as we assess in some sense the directions um, in which CEDO and other UN mechanisms for women's rights may travel as we edge close to. Um, the 50th anniversary of that first international decade for women, which I was glad that Professor Mori as well um, began with. Um, and the, of course, that legendary conference um, in Mexico um, that, that started, started us on this particular stage. Um, my primary argument today is that there is a marked shift um, in what we can think of perhaps as sort of the ecosystem of women's rights at the UN from the Mexico conference period um, to the one that surrounds CEDO and other UN mechanisms today. Um, this is not just the incremental changes that um, happen you know, over any 50 year period, uh, but there's a very marked shift that takes place broadly in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and noting, uh, and so I, you know, I'm interested in noting dimensions of the, this changed post-Cold War um, ecosystem um, to sort of try and crystallize the intellectual and political stakes of these changes. So I, you know, say if I look at that 50 year history, there's sort of these two broad periods and um, we are in, in the second period, there are, there are uh, a whole, um, uh, some, some key changes. And I want to point to sort of three dimensions of this um, ecosystem that we occupy in today. Um, one relates to the discursive structure of women's rights at the UN. Um, the second relates to its substantive focus, and the third to the institutional space for gender issues. So just very briefly, uh, to begin with the discursive structure, we can think of, uh, if we contrast the world of the Mexico conference and CEDO, for instance, with the world of the Beijing conference 20 years later and women's rights development since then, um, one very significant change, and it's sort of symptomatic, I think, of the discursive structure is the emergence of ter terminology um, like mainstreaming and empowerment in this latter phrase. Neither of those words were in in CEDO, and now, of course, they are ubiquitous all over all, all over uh, women's rights work in the uh, thing. And I'll come back to you know how we can read the work of these terms as sort of the grain of sand from which we can see something about the universe that we occupy today. Um, a second dimension, as I said, is a shift in thematic focus, and we note that there is a dramatically pronounced focus on violence against women and relatedly on women in conflict zones. This emerges as a post-Cold War phenomenon that only gets more emphatic in the aftermath of the post-9-11 wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And finally, the third dimension of that change of dimension in the institutional space for gender issues. Um, and here, one of the most remarkable dimensions of the post-9-11 world is the dramatic receptivity to gender issues in institutions such as the Security Council um, from 3025 on. I think of these three changes, what I call the discursive structure, the thematic focus, and the institutional space as deeply interrelated, as having sort of mutually reinforcing dynamics. And I'll focus first on mainstreaming and then on the focus on um, violence and conflict zones. And um, you, know, you can see both in how things resonate and repeat, that um, these, how these you know, produce in some sense circular dynamics that reinforce a particular kind of narrowing of the agenda um, of women's rights. So, you know, this to, uh, as will be evident, I'm sure, in when, I, when I speak, but I do think that there are many aspects of this change that are, are regrettable, that things that we need to use this moment to fight against. So uh, it's not change as progress, but, um, but change as a certain narrowing of the women's rights agenda and a narrowing of which voices are heard and which um, agendas get traction um, in, in institutional spaces. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, and, and particularly perhaps to say that I particularly see that there's a deprioritizing of the interests of um, you know, um, feminist movements of the global South um, and that, um, in, in, and um, concomitantly that the women's rights agendas that have traction in institutions like the Security Council were those that were compatible with or even legitimized in some cases, dominant institutions of global governance. Um, in other words, mainstreaming was what was about what was mainstreamable within these institutions within the terms of these institutions and their own particular political agendas and, um, and governance agendas and empowerment again also entailed then disempowerment in relation to the structures and drivers of global governance. 
Okay, so that's a broad claim. Um, and I've written about the larger story um, elsewhere um, in the international conflict feminism work, but let me um, use uh, take those two entry points into that broader story today by focusing first on gender mainstreaming and later on violence against women in conflict zones. So, um, okay, so the gender mainstreaming, as I mentioned earlier, is ubiquitous in UN peacekeeping, peace building circles today, and in fact, in the UN women's rights work more generally, and captures a notion that it is about sort of diverse tributaries uh, joining the mainstream, integrating into existing agendas rather than challenging them, becoming normalized rather than having an unruly presence that resists such domestication. Uh, domestication. It is striking that the central um, international instrument of women's rights, CEDAW, uh, makes no mention of gender mainstreaming. Its first high profile mention in a UN document appears in 1985 at the end of the UN Decade for Women in the Third World Conference convened in Nairobi. Um, the forward looking strategies for the advancement of women that emerged from the Nairobi conference called for mainstreaming women into development for the international community to provide the resources to accomplish that. However, mainstreaming uh, did not become an integral part of the international women's movement's uh, lexicon until a decade later in Beijing. Uh, in 1995, at the Beijing Platform and Declaration of Action invokes mainstreaming 35 times and indicates how quickly mainstreaming moved through the UN system. Uh, the Beijing Platform defines mainstreaming as the requirement that before decisions are taken, an analysis is made of the effects on women and men respectively. Right. Such an audit of gender differentiated policy consequences was interested first and foremost in a very narrow conception of gender equality as liberal inclusion. That this was both indicator and goal. Um, Kristen Godsey, among many others, has noted, for instance, that whereas prior world conferences centered on issues of political economy and structural conditions with, with little discussion of equality, um, the 1995 Beijing uh, platform's 12 areas of critical concern sidelined political economy issues with an overwhelming focus on questions of equal access and equal opportunity. Um, where equality, when I say a little discussion of equality, it's equality purely in terms of um, liberal legibility or liberal legal legibility. Thus, by 1995, the inclusion agenda of liberal equality has gained dominance under the banner yeah. of mainstreaming. Um, and then the passage of Security Council Resolution 1325, which I'll sort of keep coming back to in 2000, marked the very prominent arrival of gender mainstreaming in the peace and security field, because here we can see the convergence with the second and third dimensions that I noted before in relation to that sort of shifted, shifting um, ecosystem, um, as women's rights move from the space of dissidence and critique to the space of the most powerful institutions of global gov governance, the Security Council. And it does so under the rubric of peace and security. It is, in other words, a focus of women in conflict. The 2015 um, UN, um, just one second. The, tw uh, the 2015 UN um, Global Study, for instance, reviewing 1325, so, uh, first 15 years, notes that there's no of the you know of the 2,200 resolutions that Security Council has passed in sort of its seven decades of history. Um, it's, there's no other resolution that is as better known for its name, number, and content than Resolution 1325. Um, so there's a way in which you can see women's rights as having arrived at the Security Council, but having arrived in a very particular way, um, and which uh, provides, opens up certain doors and of course closes many others as well. To date, there are 10, uh, over 10 resolutions on women's peace and security. The ones that followed 1325 affirmed and extended its mandate. These resolutions have spoken to women's experience in contexts of war and post-conflict uh, post peace. They resolved to fight impunity for sexual violence and promote women's roles in peace building and conflict resolution processes. And there have been many, you know, I'm thinking of Dayoto in particular, but there are many people who have sort of analyzed in some sense the critical fallout of, um, of, of this particular marriage with the Security Council. Um, gender mainstreaming has aimed at parity in participation with implications for areas such as um, employment, consultation processes, and institutional leadership. Um, this arithmetic approach to gender mainstreaming has been a stated priority in a host of policy documents, um, and few of which have been as um, significant as 1325. Um, as Christy Fuja notes, the first four numbered paragraphs of 1325 um, urges uh, are all about increasing uh, representation at different levels of decision making. Um, this recommendation translates into sort of detailed policy prescriptions on how to incorporate a significant percentage of women into the peacekeeping uh, process. Um, and But there's strikingly little discussion um, about the politics of different policy directions beyond inclusion as such. Rather, whatever the direction, we have calls for women to be mainstreamed within it. And I guess that's part of the opportunity cost, the focus on um, alternative policy agendas. Um, for instance, reviewing UN initiatives for gender inclusivity, um, 
uh, colleague Anne Marie, uh, at NYU, Anne Marie Getz and Joanna Sandler draw attention to the paradox that gender mainstreaming is everywhere. There are, in, they say, 1300 gender focal points in the UN system and yet nowhere. The paradox attests to the defeat of or fading out of resistance agendas that were aimed at transformative and even disruptive social change that was so critical to the spirit of feminism, I would say, in Mexico. Um, and yet it also attests to the success after fashion of this particular mainstreaming inclusion agenda. 1,300 gender focal points, that's a lot. Um, Mainstreaming may achieve such an explosion of gender focal points across the UN system because women are treated as a homogenous category. This simplification encourages an arithmetic approach to scaling up women's participation in ways that negate a more complex approach to political agency that is not defined just by womanhood as such, or even a more multifaceted approach to feminist political agendas that are not reduced to just recognition and inclusion. What tissues get represented and channeled into policymaking may itself depend on which women's in voices, interests, and agendas can be represented and channeled into policymaking. In other words, gender mainstreaming tends towards a circular path. The particular representation of women's experience of war and gender gets mainstreamed into ICF, into conflict um, zone interventions, um, and the agencies working in conflict zones adapt projects and programs that could be mainstream. There are projects and programs that tend to get funding, policy support, institutional traction, and even normative backing from dominant discourses. The self reinforcing sort of potency of this tendency guides gender mainstreaming towards aligning its representation of women's experience of conflict with the dominant agendas of global governance regimes. And concomitantly, women's experience of conflicts that do not align with these dominant agendas tend to get marginalized or excluded from this path. For instance, in other work, I've looked at how um, women's rights um, travel in the work of donor agencies and IFIs, um, Jose mentioned the World Bank's gender mainstreaming uh, program, um, and you know, all of these organizations have um, uh, gender mainstreaming now, um, and they all have their own you know, hundreds of gender focal points um, to focus on the inclusion of women as economic actors rather than on the stakes of economic policies themselves. So institutions such as the World Bank have uh, adopted gender mainstreaming and placed significant priority on the inclusion of women. The thrust of such market-friendly mainstreaming initiatives is comfortably embedded in market logics and efforts to strengthen the business sector and empower women entrepreneurs. Um, the global governance technologies are especially empowered in arenas considered conflict zones. So in these contexts, mainstreaming becomes a path to deeper integration of women into international donor agendas, such as neoliberal market inclusion. At the same time, there's little discussion of heterodox feminist agendas for economic reform that challenge macro political economic policy advanced by those international financial institutions. The problem, of course, is not only the maldistributive dimension of donor agendas, although, of course, that's a huge problem, um, but the ways in which um, there, there is this uncritical inclusion in these agendas um, in the name of feminism. Right? As Tahira Gonsalves has argued, the gender agenda has not distanced itself from the neoliberal state building policies of many peace building interventions, even though deregulation, privatization, and liberalization negatively affect women. Diverse assessments of the impact of a number of countries in Asia and elsewhere have consistently shown that the focus on free markets and privatization exacerbated inequalities and distorted political accountability in ways that have corroded democratic participation. In this and in other areas, the work of agencies performing a gender audit assesses programs not only uh, not on not by critically examining the macroeconomic policies or their distributive consequences, but on whether they mainstream gender considerations. For instance, there's been enormous focus on gender parity and access to credit and title, um, all of these sort of microcredit programs, for instance, um, but little on the gendered consequences of sovereign debt. Um, the narrow focus on inclusion of women in arena, such as the formal economy, comes at the cost of examining the politics of the dominant economic order, or whether women are being mainstreamed into the very structures that have contributed to their own long-term economic precarity. Um, how much time do I have? Well, okay, okay. So the, I, uh, let me let me then begin to wrap up. I was going to sort of talk a bit more um, extensively about the um, shift in feminist agendas uh, that that also comes in the 1990s with a focus on violence against women and the ways in which um, the particular kinds of projects that um, that focus on violence against women, for instance, using the example of something like um, Iraq, um, where the feminist agendas get focused on uh, mainstreaming women into either the US engagements or um, the, uh, the UN's engagements on, on women in Iraq, but not on contesting the, 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 uh, the violence of the 
of, of the US intervention in the first place. So violence itself becomes a very narrow thing. So there's a focus on violence against women, but violence becomes this very narrow thing. And you know, in, in many different contexts, one can uh, one can expand on that. But um, but let me, but um, I know I'm watched um, out of time, so I'm not going to uh, go into that. Perhaps the one thing to say, however, in conclusion, um, is that uh, you know part of the agenda for CEDA, there, there are you know although I've said that this narrowing at the at, at sort of the heights of the of international institutions of global governance, there are of course um, a, a whole range of uh, plural women's rights movements in the world out there that are engaging even if they don't have the audibility in international um, in, in in international public uh, law, uh, law and policy fora. Um, and that part of the agenda for CEDAW and women's rights movements at this stage uh, um, is to contribute to the global audibility of those plural, plural global feminisms, including the many anti-imperial, anti-racist, and left feminisms with priorities and interests that seek to challenge the dominant world order. So let me stop there. Thank you uh, very much. At this point, let me also remind uh, folks on Zoom uh, that they can uh, put in the Q&A box your questions, and we will uh, at some point introduce them. And I encourage you to do it now rather than at the end when we've run out of time. So if you do have questions, write them in and we will try to incorporate it. Uh, we have built in some discussion for that purpose. So now let's turn to Carol Peterson, who I think will present us uh, in her own words, a somewhat more optimistic look at, uh, at these issues. Uh, she's a professor at law uh, at the uh, University of Hawaii's William S. Richardson School of Law, and she teaches in the areas of uh, protection of human rights, comparative law, uh, gender, law and conflicts, uh, as well as the basic courses on international law. She's written extensively, as all of these folks have, uh, but she also comes from the world of practice. She taught uh, law in Hong Kong, and before that, she was a practicing lawyer here in New York and in Honolulu. She's been active in the University of Hong Kong's Women's Studies Research Center, assisted members of the Hong Kong Legislative Council to draft bills prohibiting discrimination, has conducted extensive research on the use of conciliation to resolve complaints of discrimination and sexual harassment. Uh, among her many publications, a few uh, left out uh, given our discussions so far. Uh, Human Rights in Asia, Comparative Legal Study of 12 Asian Jurisdictions and France and the United States way back in 2006. Seems to have anticipated this conference by uh, quite a number of years. Uh, Women's Rights in Asia, uh, chapters that she's written uh, that will be coming in a forthcoming book on the Oxford Handbook of Constitutional Law in Asia. But she's also written about some of the specific issues that we've already addressed, reproductive autonomy and laws prohibiting discriminatory abortions. And uh, most particularly um, in uh, 2010, population policy and eugenic theory, implications of China's ratification of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. With that, turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Um... I'm actually flew here from Hawaii for two conferences. Um, yesterday, I attended the opening session of International Law Weekend, which is organized every year by the American branch of the International Law Association. And one of the first speakers, who is a former judge of the European Court of Human Rights and also from Ukraine, was understandably rather negative about the state of international law. Basically, she said to us, let's face it, we're no longer in that golden age of human rights. Um, and I would say it is indeed very easy to conclude right now that perhaps the UN's mechanisms for human rights have really fallen short, partly due to the critique that was just offered, but also because of the very soft enforcement processes. Governments ratify treaties, the UN convenes endless meetings, and it produces mountains of documents in many different languages. But has this grand project made any difference? Um, with respect to some human rights treaties, I have to confess that I am also rather dubious regarding their impact. But today we're talking about CEDAW, and with respect to CEDAW, I am still an optimist. In my view, the CEDAW treaty has helped to establish a far more substantive concept of equality than exists in most national constitutions, 
Moreover, the CEDAW reporting process, the general recommendations issued by the CEDAW committee and its decisions under the optional protocol have gradually persuaded many governments to take sometimes incremental but positive steps to address discrimination in both public and private spheres. The CEDAW committee has also strived to ensure that the voices of women are heard, even if they are not represented in the official government delegations. This very active engagement with civil society has now become the norm for UN human rights treaty monitoring bodies, but it really started with the CEDAW committee. Not all governments like that change. Beijing's been pushing against it for years, but without the participation of civil society, the international reporting process would be a far less productive and engaged process. So today I'm going to talk about three jurisdictions, Hong Kong, South Korea, and Taiwan which have all experienced enormous economic and political change since World War II. And they each have a very interesting CEDAW story to tell. I'm going to apologize for oversimplifying, but I just have 15 minutes. I'm gonna start with Hong Kong, partly because I taught there for 17 years, but also because it is a great example of a jurisdiction that initially did its very best to avoid CEDAW. When I first moved to Hong Kong in 1989, I sort of assumed that CEDAW applied because I knew the UK had already ratified and it was a British colony. But I quickly learned that the UK had deliberately left Hong Kong out of its ratification. Why? That's what the local colonial government requested. Um, at that time, there was substantial legislation that discriminated against women, including a ban on female inheritance of much of the land in Hong Kong and protective legislation that regulated where they could work and when their hours um, were considered excessive. Uh, the private business community was completely unregulated in, in the sense of discrimination, however. There was absolutely no anti-discrimination legislation that applied to the private sector. Colonial government had no interest in changing this, and the very powerful business community wanted to keep Hong Kong's free market intact. At that time, you could open any newspaper and you could find ads asking for a female secretary under the age of 35 or a male engineer under, under the age of 40. Even law firms would sometimes post ads at our law school specifying whether they wanted to hire a male or female article, article clerk, which was the term then for a trainee solicitor. The situation finally began to change in the 1990s. The colonial government wanted to build public confidence before the handover in 1997, and so it introduced a local bill of rights, which it copied from the ICCPR, which does, of course, include a right to equality, although without the detail that we see in CEDAW. The Hong Kong women's movement used the hearings on this draft bill of rights to raise awareness regarding sex discrimination. They argued that the new bill of rights should apply to the private sector, business community, managed to prevent that from happening. But the publicity got the momentum going and three female legislators took advantage of the momentum. Emily Lau introduced a motion in LegCo calling for the British to apply Hong Kong, seat out to Hong Kong, which passed. Christine Lowe introduced a bill to reform the ban on female inheritance of land and Anna Wu introduced the Equal Opportunities Bill, the legislation that Jose mentioned that I worked on. Her bill did not pass in the end, but two compromise bills were enacted um, which prohibited discrimination on the grounds of sex and disability. And that was the first time there was any prohibition on discrimination in employment, education, housing, goods and services in Hong Kong. These changes cleared the way for the British government to finally apply CEDAW to Hong Kong just in time before the handover in 1996, albeit with some reservations that I can explain in questions if we have time. Um, in some ways, I think CEDAW wound up having more impact in Hong Kong than it has in the UK, partly because women had to fight for it and they got very involved in the reporting process. Uh, one of my former co-authors, Harriet Samuels, a British academic, she and I did a little comparative study and we found that women in the UK were really not that interested <laughs> in CEDAW. They went to their member of parliament or maybe relied on European law they didn't really use CEDAW. In contrast, women in Hong Kong, because they fought for it, they got very active in the reviews by the CEDAW committee. In the lead up to each of the three reviews that have been completed so far, they have always had conferences, workshops, joint um, submissions by coalitions of NGOs, and the Legislative Council would always convene a debate on the concluding observations and ask the Hong Kong government 
to make changes. And the Hong Kong government has made changes, sometimes not as revolutionary as we would like, but if I have more time at, in questions, I can give you some examples of changes that have been made in, directly in response to CEDAW committee concluding observations. Now, of course, Hong Kong has changed a great deal since the last review. Um, Hong Kong submitted its most recent report in March of 2020. The list of issues were sent to the government in 2021, and normally this would be a very active period for Hong Kong women's organizations, but in July 2020, Beijing imposed the new national security law. And the local government is now actively prosecuting people not only under that law, but under an old sedition law that the British colonial government left in place, although it should have repealed it long before 1997. So many of the local legislators who were supportive of women's rights in Hong Kong are now in jail, or they have been made ineligible to run for office because Beijing has imposed a new patriots only model for the Legislative Council. In this atmosphere, I don't know whether NGOs will still be able to critique the government in the international arena. On the other hand, the Hong Kong government has also made it clear that it really wants to promote Hong Kong's image and rebuild its image internationally. So this may be an opportunity to lobby for some changes that the government was unwilling to make in the past. I think one of the key issues, and I'm so glad we have a new member of the CEDAW committee here, is whether the CEDAW committee will ask the Hong Kong government about whether women are still free to critique it in the international arena. This summer, the Human Rights Committee did quite a good job of repeating that question to the Hong Kong delegation when it was reviewing Hong Kong's compliance with the ICCPR. Um, and I hope that the CEDAW committee will do the same. Um, moving on, my second case study, because I know I'm short on time, is South Korea. In contrast to Hong Kong, which resisted CEDAW, South Korea has been quite enthusiastic, partly because it helped to demonstrate its transition from an authoritarian state to a very highly respected member of the international community. You're right that Korea still ranks very low in the gender equality indexes, but I do think its engagement with CEDAW has improved matters. And if you look at the fact that, number one, they started by filing a number of reservations to the nationality law, to Article 16, uh, family relations. But over time, Korea has reformed those laws and has been gradually withdrawing those reservations. And the 2022 report indicates that they have a new bill that will hopefully abolish the patrilineal surname system under which a child automatically receives their father's surname. And that may lead to the eventual withdrawal of the final reservation to CEDAW. Um, Korea has also established a National Human Rights Commission. There are controversies, as always, regarding funding and independence, but it is a full member of the Asia-Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutes. And perhaps most strikingly, Korea has ratified the optional protocol and to CEDAW, and it has embraced special measures and even quotas, which is really interesting. A lot of countries, including Hong Kong and Taiwan and uh, Japan, have definitely refused to do that. Um, so the current president is very hostile to quotas and said he might even abolish the Ministry of Gender Equality, but I don't think that's going to happen, because I think with the upcoming review by the CEDAW committee, uh, it would be rather embarrassing to report in your 2022 report, which Korea has done, about all these wonderful special measures that have been adopted, and then by the time the review comes around, you have to explain why they've been repealed. So I think, if I'm right about this, that ratifying CEDAW and the optional protocol may actually help to preserve some of the changes, the reforms in Korea, even as governments change. I'm gonna skip over some of the court decisions in the interest of time, because I wanna save a few minutes for my final case study, and that is Taiwan, which I think might be the most interesting one because it's not a member of the UN. It can't even participate in the formal international reporting process for CEDAW. But the legislature voted to adopt CEDAW in 2007, and the government went ahead and designed its own international reporting process. It invites international experts to perform a review and issue recommendations, not only on CEDAW, but on other human rights treaties. This regular reporting is now required by law in Taiwan, and there's a very prominent gender equality committee in the executive branch. Clearly, Taiwan has a publicity. Um, goal here. It has an incentive to use CEDAW and other human rights treaties to demonstrate to the world that it has a much better human rights record than mainland China. This is a key component of Taiwan's argument that it should not be forced to integrate with the mainland. 
But I would argue that CDAO has provided more than just positive publicity. I do not have time to go through all the policy initiatives, but I would invite you to visit the website of the Gender Equality Committee, which is very comprehensive and conveniently available in English. Uh, it is also very up to date as Taiwan just published its fourth CEDAW report in March 2022. The list of issues were produced in September and the government's responses were just added, I think, this week. There is also a report from the National Human Rights Commission, which is, I think, quite independent of the Taiwan government. And there are many, many NGO reports. Contrast that with the situation when mainland China reports to the CEDAW committee. You won't find many independent NGO reports coming from within China. Um, Indeed, in many ways, I would conclude by saying that maybe Taiwan's unofficial review process is arguably superior to the official CEDAW reporting process because the poor UN CEDAW committee is desperately under-resourced. It has a backlog of state reports awaiting review. And as a result, many state reports become stale. The data is old, and sometimes the list of issues even seem to be asking about yesterday's issues. In contrast, Taiwan's reports always come out, they're produced like clockwork, um, and the review happens very promptly because the Taiwan government pays <laughs> and makes sure that it happens very promptly. It is also a very local event that gets lots of news coverage domestically in Taiwan, which makes it very easy for women's organizations to get engaged in the process. So perhaps this is a model for us to think about for other jurisdictions as well. And I might conclude by thinking mentioning that we have a CEDAW, uh, cities for CEDAW movement in the United States in which American local communities that wish the U.S. Senate would ratify CEDAW have made their own commitments to implement the treaty. Perhaps we could suggest that they might want to and invite their own international review panels to review their implementation. Maybe that would embarrass some people in the U.S. Senate and get them to ratify the treaty. Finally, I would conclude by suggesting a few lessons that I think are broader than these three jurisdictions. Um, I think we have to accept that the impact of CEDAW will naturally vary. I've done comparative research on other jurisdictions as well. And in my mind, there's kind of a sweet spot for CEDAW. Um, jurisdictions where NGOs have freedom of expression and can use CEDAW in their advocacy and where the government even if they don't really love CEDAW, they have an incentive to get a good report card, either from the UN CEDAW committee or from, through some other informal process like the one used in Taiwan. Clearly not all jurisdictions fall inside that sweet spot. If the US refuses to ratify altogether. We don't seem to care that much about what international human rights treaty bodies think. China actively stifles NGOs and the courts are not independent so they can't refer, really enforce CEDAW domestically. Um, and China also now flatly rejects most critical comments from treaty bodies. But there are still a lot of jurisdictions that do fall within that sweet spot. And so while I think CEDAW is of course not the perfect fix for all the ills in the world, I do think that regular reviews by the CEDAW committee and the follow-up letters that the CEDAW committee sends can help to promote gender equality, can also sometimes help to preserve gains even when a government might become more hostile to the goals in CEDAW. And that is why I'm still an optimist with respect to CEDAW. Thank you very much. Thanks for making us feel slightly better. So our last speaker before we open it up for discussion, both here and on Zoom, is Ranjita de Silva de Alves, who's a globally recognized international uh, women's rights expert. Uh, she'll be teaching in the fall, Women, Peace and Security at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, but right now she's at the University of Pennsylvania at Cary Law School, where she's an Associate Dean of International Affairs, teaching international women's rights, women law and leadership, and a policy lab as well. She directs a, the Global Institute for Human Rights, and uh, she has won numerous awards, and as you've already heard, is about to step into that August body that we have just been talking about, This the 23 person CEDAW committee, and I'd be curious what your goals are when you get there. Um, and she is a, a non-resident senior fellow at Harvard Law School Center on Legal Profession, where she co-authored a study with the Undersecretary General on the transformative impact of business leadership, innovation, and inclusivity to accelerate the SDGs, which we haven't mentioned. I don't know if you plan to talk about that. And she also serves on the UN Women High Level Working Group on Women's Access to Justice. 
as an advisor uh, on gender equality also at UNESCO. How she has time to do all of that and still fly here uh, to participate in the conference is a tribute to your energy. Take it away. So it is because of the rigor that my fellow panelists bring to the CEDAW committee's jurisprudence that I look forward to serving on the CEDAW committee starting in 2023. So, uh, Jose, you have asked me to serve as the prophet on this panel to look at the future of the CEDAW. I'm afraid that I'm going to be more of a Cassandra-like prophetess in looking at some of the critiques um, and some of the ways in which the CEDAW can be more transformative in addressing some of the global challenges that we have all discussed this morning. So I'm going to start with one of CEDAW's biggest priorities. And this is a priority that you spoke of, you started speaking of, which is America's own recalcitrance in ratifying the CEDAW. And despite the fact that the Carter administration has signed on to the CEDAW, and despite the fact that then Senator Biden has called this time is a wasting. And our late great Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, has called it long past time for the United States to ratify the CEDAW. We still remain strange bedfellows with Iran, Tonga, Palau, and Sudan in the non ratification of the CEDAW. So I would like to begin by echoing some of the sentiments that you made um, early on and um, quoting from Louis Henking, who has said, in the Cathedral of Human Rights, the United States is more like a flying buttress than a pillar, choosing to stand outside the international structure, supporting the international human rights system, but without being willing to subject its own conduct to the scrutiny of that system. So that is that central paradox that we see with the United States. And to a large part, our own discourse here in the United States helps to reinforce that paradox. And I speak to my own great um, you know, mentor and scholar, um, Harold Cole, who in his canonical uh, scholarship has written about the ways in which America's recalcitrance to ratify the CEDAW erodes America's authority on the global stage. Its moral authority suffers because of its lack of, um, uh, lack, because of its recalcitrance to ratify the CEDAW. However, I critique that, that hubris that is present in that notion that America's ratification of the CEDAW is good for, the, good for America's reputation on the global stage, and that it is good for America's uh, uh, moral authority in getting other countries to comply with the CEDAW. In my own scholarship, I have addressed that, um, that uh, hubris where I say it is important for the United States domestic policy for the United States to ratify the CEDAW. And at this moment in time, there is a global public reckoning that was triggered by the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, and now DOPS, where it creates an urgency. There's a fierce urgency of now in Martin Luther King's words for America to ratify the CEDAW. So it is not only because our moral authority suffers and is eroded, by America's um, resistance to the CEDAW, but because it is important for America's own domestic agenda. Secondly, I look at the ways in which there is another paradox present in the ways in which the United States in a bipartisan manner supports the women, peace and security agenda. In fact, I argue that 1820, Security Council Resolution 1820, which is part of the progeny of 1325. Vasuki mentioned that there are nine Security Council resolutions that were adopted after the adoption of 1325, which was, as Vasuki uh, mentioned, uh, considered the crowning achievement of the global women's movement, despite the fact that we continue to critique 1325 
uh, and its limitations. So um, 13, uh, 1820, which for the first time introduced this phrase, conflict-related sexual violence, was introduced at the Security Council by Secretary Condoleezza Rice. And when she was introducing it, she mentioned that there is a resounding yes to the fact that sexual violence in conflict is now a matter of the Security Council's highest priorities. And a few months later, Secretary Clinton introduced Security Council Resolution 1888, which provided structure to the Security Council resolution that was introduced by Condoleezza Rice. So I argue that there is a paradox, an inherent paradox, where America has thrown its weight behind the WPS agenda while it's still reluctant to ratify the CEDAW. And is it because the WPS agenda is very much confined to conflict-related violence against women? So there is this sense that America's interest on the protection of women is only during a time of conflict and not before conflict or after conflict. And I was uh, discussing with Jose that last afternoon I hosted a non-permanent member of the Security Council, Sierra Leone, which will, um, uh, uh, which will assume its position as president in 2023. And the Sierra Leone um, ambassador was, along with Japan, um, uh, a country that introduced before the General Assembly in September, the very first landmark resolution on access to justice for women survivors, for men, women and male survivors of sexual violence. And the clear message was that rape happens outside of conflict. And that conflict alone is not the only theater where women's bodies are violated. So I wanted to start with that first pillar of that my discussion, the importance of the ratification of the CEDAW by the United States, and that is a major priority for the CEDAW committee, which looks for universal ratification of the CEDAW. And it provides the kind of weight, it provides the moral authority that the CEDAW committee looks for if the United States were to fall behind and adopt the CEDAW. The second uh, part of my discussion is organized around some of the issues that all three of you raised, the jurisprudence of the CEDAW. And Jose, as you mentioned, the jurisprudence of the CEDAW is sustained through its uh, optional protocols. And uh, the exceptional inquiry process is right now being exercised in the case of Afghanistan. In the case of the second takeover of Afghanistan by, by the Taliban. We see in Afghanistan at this moment in time, the only country in the world that has banned girls' education. The only country in the world that has suspended its constitution. So there is no operational constitution in Afghanistan. So these two markers demand that uh, the CEDAW operates on an exceptional inquiry process. And in my own study of Afghanistan's legal system, the elimination of violence against women in Article 5 creates 22 categories of violence, including denial of girls' and women's education as a form of violence. I use this as a model to look at the ways in which Afghanistan in its law moved away from interpersonal acts of violence to structural forms of violence. Looking at the denial of education, the disruption of education as structural systemic forms of violence, moving away, shifting from the orthodoxy of interpersonal physical forms of violence. And that is the argument that I make to the, w, to the Security Council 
in adopting a new Security Council resolution that is within the corpus of the WPS agenda that looks at violence against women more broadly in a more nuanced manner that shifts from a fetishization of women's bodies and sexual violence in conflict to the ways in which violence is one that encompasses intellectual violence and the ways in which denial of girls and women's education constitutes a form of educational violence, intellectual violence that impacts the empowerment of women. And that once again takes us to the critique of the WPS agenda that uh, Vasuki started uh, elaborating on, that the WPS agenda is built on four pillars. I do not have the time to go to look at all of the pillars, but two central pillars, one of protection and one of participation and one of prevention, the third pillar of prevention and the fourth is peace building. And the WPS agenda as it stands is one that focuses primarily on protection and protection of women's bodies rather than the empowerment of women's minds and the, and the intellectual participation of women in peace building and peacemaking and in the, um, and the sustaining of peace. So Afghanistan right now is a primary example of the ways in which the CEDAW needs to act and act fast on this exceptional inquiry process, not only because of the Afghan women and the Afghan girls who are not only denied education, but there are 31 decrees that have been passed by the Taliban, starting with a call to the, um, to, the, to the religious leaders to create a database of women from the age of 12 to 45 who are unmarried, who could serve as wives to the Taliban leadership. So that was the first decree that was passed. The final decree is the one that mandates a full face covering for women in public, including being accompanied by a maharam, a male guardian. Um, uh, if, she, if she travels uh, within 72 kilometers from her house. So her access to education, her access to healthcare, her access to public service have been curtailed um, with these decrees to a point where the, Talib, uh, where the Afghan women's leadership caused this agenda apartheid. Now, as lawyers, we're reluctant to use those terms, but I would like to, I would like the CEDAW to define the defi denial of education as a tool of conflict. Just the way in which we have defined um, sexual violence in conflict as a tool of war, I would like to see the CEDAW de uh, defining the denial of education the wholesale blanket denial of education and the banning of schools for girls over the uh, over sixth grade as a tool of war, because this has been a weapon that the Taliban has been using to segregate women and girls from public life. So the third, the, the third pillar for our conversation will be the one that uh, focuses on the general recommendations, the new general recommendation that the CEDAW committee will be drafting and I hope to be involved in. And that this focuses on stereotypes. To me, that is probably the most forward looking uh, vision for the CEDAW, because as many of you know, Article 5 of the CEDAW was the most contested of the provisions of the CEDAW treaty, because of the ways in which it called for addressing traditional and cultural practices, and looking at the ways in which gender stereotypes subordinate both women and men. And that was, as you know, resisted by many states because it spoke to the very heart of state accountability. So having a gender recommendation that provides nuance, texture, and provides the kind of richness of understanding of stereotypes that's uh, enshrined both in Article 5 of the CEDAW as well as Article 10C of the CEDAW 
uh, treaty, which looks at education, education, right to education for women and girls. And within that uh, framing looks at stereotypes in education and in curricula and in pedagogy. So again, when I look at stereotypes, I want to bring a vision that really um, expands the notion of how we define stereotypes. So I have often quoted um, a, a former CEDAW committee member, a very well-known former CEDAW committee member from Israel, who has, uh, Francis Rade, who has said that one of the most prevalent stereotypes in the world is the belief that maternity is women's natural role. And I often quote her because I do uh, understand the ways in which this pervasive stereotype that uh, motherhood is a woman's natural status subordinates women both in the family as well as in public life and subordinates men who want to perform the role of a caregiver in the family. At the same time, I see some kind of an enlightenment conceit in that because it, it doesn't really take into consideration the more nuanced stereotypes that women like Isabel Wilkerson discuss in her book on caste. Because stereotypes are not only explicit stereotypes, but they are so pervasive, so invisible, so much a part of the fabric of our institutions that to the untrained eye, they are almost invisible. And as Isabel Wilkerson has said, modern day caste protocols are less often about overt attacks. They are like the wind, powerful enough to knock you down, but invisible as they go about doing their work. So it is that invisibility that I want to bring to the forefront of an understanding of stereotypes. It is not only about pregnancy and motherhood, which are more visible forms of stereotypes, but those invisible yet to be named stereotypes. And in every generation, there are new forms of biases. This new generation of biases that the students in this school, the students in my school often identify that are yet to be named, need to be named in this general recommendation. And in doing so, I would like to look at a whole new category of um, evolving burgeoning biases that create the structural and the systemic challenges that institutionalize biases like never before. And that is AI-led bias. The ways in which algorithmic biases have uh, institutionalize, systematize our cognitive biases, the ways in which human biases bleed into um, AI-led algorithms is going to really um, reshape our world. And if we are not careful, the way in which gender biases, uh, racial biases, racial stereotypes, so our biases and stereotypes about colonialism, about the empire, about the ways in which the rural urban divide, age, disability, and ability, the ways in which LGBTQ biases bleed into and are baked into AI need to be addressed through this general recommendation. So it is important that we move away from the orthodoxy of understanding stereotypes as these overt forms of more explicit forms of stereotypes to understanding the more nuanced yet to be named uh, biases that are being in, um, in, in Judith Butler's words, uh, you know, gender is constructed through performance and performance is reconstructed uh, uh, reproduced through artificial intelligence in the ways in which um, uh, these what are considered to some extent mathematical neutral algorithms are led by, uh, in Melinda Gates' words, by the performance of white men in hoodies. 
And I think it is important given the asymmetry in the workforce in Silicon Valley among developers, engineers, programmers, CEOs, that unless we see a shift in the leadership of, um, of technology, we are going to see a continuing um, uh, the, the, the continuing the continuation of these biases through AI, which is even more dangerous than any other type of human biases. So these are some of the ways in which I would like to help the CEDAW envision a more modernist understanding of its role in the world. And finally, because I want to have more time for questions, my fourth uh, vision for the CEDAW is a broader understanding of intersectionality. Intersectionality, as we know, and as uh, uh, you uh, discuss, uh, Vasuki, is, is yet an incomplete business with the CEDAW. It is an unfinished business. There is, there is a, a sense that the CEDAW is timorous about its engagement with intersectionality. General Recommendation 28 starts to discuss a more uh, vivid understanding of uh, CEDAW's Article 2 on an understanding of gender discrimination, and it does categorize different forms and different uh, intersections that complicate gender. And as we know, gender is only one axis of difference, and we need to look at these other ongoing intersecting forms of differences that are going to be the ways in which we can address the most important stereotypes, the ways in which women and minorities often experience bias, prejudice, and stereotypical behaviors and patterns of conduct. But in doing that, I also want to look at the ways in which the CEDAW must work together with other treaty bodies, including the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Article 6 was the first article in the 21st century that looked at intersectionality, that looked at the compounded nature of discrimination against women with disabilities. Article 11, which looks at, um, looks at the role that persons with disabilities play in peace building and conflict resolution. But I want the CEDAW to be more ambitious in its agenda, to look beyond the human rights treaties, to look beyond the WPS agenda, to look beyond the sustainable development goal. Yes, sustainable goal uh, goals, uh, goal five lays out a whole map of areas that the CEDAW connects with on a regular basis. The general recommendations 30 looks at the ways in which it can elaborate on the WPS agenda, but there are new, more evolving Security Council resolutions that speak to the crisis that we are facing at this moment in time. The global challenges that we are facing at this moment in time are yet to become the focus of the CEDAW. And you did speak about the ways in which a market-driven um, agenda is complicating uh, the ways in which we look at gender and the United Nations. But at the same time, we have to understand these forces and the CEDAW needs to be at the forefront of addressing some of these challenges of our time. And that is why food insecurity is probably the most challenging global crisis at this moment in time. And the CEDAW must articulate its response to food insecurity and the feminization of poverty. And that is why I would call on the CEDAW to look carefully at 2417 in 2018, which uh, uh, the Security Council addressed starvation as a form of warfare. So the war against poverty and the war against starvation and the war against food insecurity needs to be made central to the CEDAW committee's agenda. Uh, the CEDAW committee must also look at very closely 2601. 2601 was adopted by uh, Niger and Norway in October of last year in response to the school closures by Afghanistan and the school closures in the Sahel region during the COVID um, 
pandemic. But I argue that that is a very narrow understanding of the importance of safe schools in conflict because it only looks at disruption of schools. It doesn't look at the quality of education in, that is uh, in th that links to peace building and the ways in which education is most often Jose, it could either be a victim of war, a casualty of war or a perpetrator of conflict, the kinds of education can help to divide communities, can divide and exacerbate ethnic tensions, religious tensions. And we see that in uh, some of the extremist curricula, uh, in not only in countries such as Afghanistan, it could be, you know, the, uh, in, in, in Myanmar, uh, extremist ideologies are spawned in some of these educational institutions in the United States and around the world. So it is important that we look at not only uh, and that, that we do not think of education as an unalloyed public good. That again is, I think, an enlightenment conceit, but we need to look at what is the pur purpose of education in peace building. And so 2601 can be the starting point to understand in the role of education, the role of academic institutions in peace building and in gender equality and in addressing racism, sexism, and colonialism. So finally, I do want to end by quoting once again, Isabel Wilkerson, because I can't think of anyone who writes in such lyrical terms about the ways in which the caste system continues to be invisible um, modern day caste protocols, as I said, are less often about overt attacks or conscious hostility and can be dispiritingly hard to fight. They are like the wind, powerful enough to knock you down, but invisible as they go about doing their work. So I want the CEDAW to be more visible in addressing those invisible challenges that women and underrepresented minorities face in today's ch challenges. Thank you. And you will bring a revolution to the CEDAW committee once you arrive. So we have uh, 10 minutes. Um, if the panelists wanna comment on each other, there was some overlap. Um, anything you wanna correct or challenge of each other? No? All right, then we'll proceed to Frank. Uh, I speak in the microphone. Uh, I, I'm going to be uh, rather pessimistic, but first I want to uh, note that uh, Masako Mori was here before as a visiting scholar, and uh, she brought her young daughter with her. We now have a visiting scholar from Japan who has brought his young child with him. So there, are, there have been substantial changes or significant changes in Japan. Uh, but I think uh, I, overall, I'm not sure you can call uh, uh, Masako's presentation as optimistic or pessimistic as Jose notes. She's a very accomplished politician. And I'm, so I'm not sure she committed herself one way or the other. Uh, but I'd like to pull out as far as, far as the CEDAW uh, aspect and note uh, Professor Silva de Awis's comment about the importance of domestic politics. Japan has uh, ratified CEDAW, and the 1985 law that uh, Masako mentioned was in direct response uh, politically, if you look at the political rhetoric, to uh, the decade of women, 1975 and 1985. That law, however, did not prohibit a single act of gender discrimination. It codified the prohibition of gender discrimination that had been achieved by judicial action brought by lawyers, many of them women. One of the things that's nice about the bar exam in Japan is it's all uh, it, it's totally by merit. So women have, were able to become lawyers 
long before they can become other kinds of things in business and so on, because there was no room for discrimination. And there was a range of cases brought against unequal wages, against unequal uh, promotion and other things. And when, C when the 1985 Act was passed, it codified those previously judicially created, in other words, by domestic politics, uh, uh, prohibition on, on gender discrimination. It did not prohibit anything that had not yet already been prohibited by the courts. Mm -hmm. Instead, they, the law uh, had something called uh, the obligation to strive. So Japanese companies had an obligation to try to discriminate, to try to eliminate discrimination, but they didn't have an obligation not to discriminate, just to try. I unfortunately equate that with disclosure mm -hmm. that she mentioned. So Japan ratified uh, CEDAW, uh, I, 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 sometime before 1985, um, the US hasn't. As people have mentioned, Japan is way, way, way down or way up in the presence of gender discrimination. And I'm not sure, I think if you're looking at Japan and you wanna say, is our, our statutes being passed, do they have any meaning? You wanna look very closely at the text of the statute. Does it make something illegal or does it just require the company to tell you about it? Um, and I think that's, and I also want to talk also about um, Professor Silva de Alvarez's comment about stereotypes and the subordination of men because of gender discrimination. And I think gender discrimination we, we address it almost entirely from the point of view of harm to women. Mm -hmm. There is profound harm to men in gender discrimination. When I was a father in Japan of a kid in a kindergarten, no other man ever, ever took his kid to kindergarten. It was a Japanese school, obviously, a Japanese neighborhood. Because of gender discrimination in Japan, men were, were forced to, or prevented from being full members of their families. So when we look at the 78%, 78.6% employment rate for women, and we relate that to Moscow's comment that progress has been low in politics and economy, but good in education and health. So you have well-educated Japanese women, better educated than Japanese men, and they're healthy. And what do they do in society? Because of gender discrimination, they work in jobs that are demanding, that are technically requ require technical competence, but which provide almost no way to advance. Uh, all of Prime Minister Abe's, the late Prime Minister Abe's, unfortunately, uh, womenomics, you see they still rank whatever it is, 114th or something like that. And yet they have done all of the rhetorical stuff, but you've got to get again to the attitudes and domestic politics to implement uh, those ideas. So in the end, I'll just say, she talks, uh, Masako talked about uh, the hidden asset of Japanese women. They certainly are hidden when you look at the top ranks of exercising power. They're not hidden if you look at who does huge amounts of the very demanding, uh, technically required, requiring good education, that Japanese companies have it perfect. They've got women they can put and work hard, not as hard as the men, but very demanding, and yet they can keep this stereotypes again of, of a group of men at the top. Okay, thank you so much. There was something I wanted to respond to um, 
the Honorable Mori's comments, and there was an absence in her comments. She, I think, uh, she ignored the fact that the greatest challenge that women are facing right now in Japan is the way in which the law itself is complicit in their subordination in an indirect manner. And I think that is why the CEDO, especially uh, CEDO's Article 2, which calls for both direct, uh, 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 for the CEDO to address both direct and indirect forms of uh, discrimination must be brought forward. So you, you probably are very aware of this, Professor, that there is a law that calls for husbands and wives to take one single last name. So both parties to the marriage must have the same name. And, and although it seems so gender funny, neutral uh, on the face of it, you know, there is this indirect uh, discrimination. It's not direct because it is where the law itself is complicit in this indirect uh, discrimination where, you know, 99.9% .9 of the families take the, the, uh, the husband's name. The I think it's only 98.6. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, well, and the court upheld it yeah. as constitutional, right? And that really shows the difference. I mean, Japan's court has been very deferential um, and, and this does not apply any sort of even intermediate scrutiny, I would say. Um, but what I wanted to add to Frank's comment is that the Hong Kong women's movement, and I think women all around Asia, are well aware of what happened in Japan. Um, and I can remember that when... The Hong Kong government finally realized, because Anna Wu's bill was pending and getting also support, they finally realized they're going to have to change their opposition to any form of anti-discrimination legislation. The first thing they proposed was, how about the Japan model? And some of the pro-government academics actually published articles suggesting, oh, yes, let's do the Japan model. But all the women's groups knew how ineffective it had been, and they were just absolutely insistent that they would not accept that. And the last thing I would say, same thing was true in Hong Kong. My husband was the only one who came to school. We shared a, a volunteer position at our school for our son, and it was adorable because when they invited all the volunteers for the mother's tea, my husband was the only one who got to come who wasn't a mother. <laughs> and but, the same with, with uh, parental leave. Yes, and yes. Right. Right. But now Hong Kong just this year introduced paternity leave. So little by little by little, but it is in, gradual. In Japan, nobody takes it, though, if it's that. Right. Guy. And it'll probably be a while before men take it in Hong Kong as well. Other comments? Yes, Judith. Um, yeah, I have one um, comment. There was a question because you said that uh, Cito going to be drafting an AI. And I find it fascinating to say, I think I read all the Documents are so, CEDO so, by so, now. No, no, no. This is something I'm proposing to the CEDO okay. as it drafts uh, the the uh, the general recommendation on stereotypes. That we really need to look at uh, more nuanced and evolving, complicated areas of stereotypes that are being uh, uh, launched by AI. But yet, one comment on that because something I've been since noticed: everything on gender-based violence does not really talk to the cyber sphere, where a lot of um, you know gender-based and also sexual violence takes place. Absolutely. And to me, it almost felt like it's a cyber-blind convention, and I think it would be great Absolutely. to make progress in that regard. Um, <laughs> that's the comment. But now the questions. Um, so, in fact, I would want to um, expand the definition of violence against women and the form forms of uh, violence against women, which, as you know, are evolving, you know, physical, mental, psychosocial, verbal, economic, to include uh, digital forms of violence. It alludes to that, yes. And I would assume also structural economic violence. <laughs> um, but so my question um, was, and I think um, it's um, for all three of you, um, and I start from the case study, South Korea, where there apparently has been a joining to the optional protocol mm -hmm. and that was acceptable, you know, that the comedy really look deep into not just cases, but also inquiry procedures. And I'm interested in what the reason was for this different take. That's one question. Then one question, um, and I think it goes to gender mainstreaming and also CEDAW as a universal treaty. Um, what is, you know, the cost of rolling out one universal st standard through, like back then, maybe colonial laws, even though there has been this exception, but that not everyone was at the 
drafting table when the convention um, was first, um, you know, signed and ratified, um, and they're not equally represented. So I, I wonder if there's also just um, price you pay, and then third, and I think that is a bit of the utopia question because you said you do pay a very high price for gender mainstreaming, and you do pay. Um, the price of a feminist agenda is not there that probably would be shared um, around the world. Um, and there's also many contestations there, but what's the alternative and how can you um, start you know, building these alternative worlds and agendas that then also at some point form institutions that are maybe more acceptable? Three long questions. <laughs> you answered to... <laughs> It should be you. Yeah. You take all minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess the, you know, the since CEDA actually doesn't use the language of mainstreaming, I think actually CEDA can actually be a ground from which to contest the way mainstreaming has got, uh, got interpreted in some sense. And CEDA, I think, does provide a broader spectrum of under, of ways in which one can address issues around women's rights. So, um, so yeah, so I think it's from, it's in some sense, from the archive of women's rights uh, 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 institutions and, and doctrines that we also contest th those that are dominant. So. Well, I could just briefly address your question about universal convention. I mean, the CEDAW Treaty is not as old, say, as Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where really it was, you know, excluding a lot of uh, recently independent countries. I mean, a lot of those countries did participate in CEDAW. I, I would accept, though, that there is a tension sometimes between the CEDAW committee and governments um, when it comes to cultural and religious practices. And I think if one of the things I often do with my students is I assign them to watch, I think it was 2018 when Malaysia was reviewed by the CEDAW committee. You can watch the videos on the UN now. And there was a really heated discussion about female genital cutting in Malaysia because a fatwa had been issued. It was mandatory for infant girls. And the CEDAW, the Malaysian government's response was, we decided to medicalize it, do it under anesthesia, um, promote a lesser form of the cutting so that it's not as harmful. Basically harm reduction, I would say. You could look at it that way. And um, the CEDAW committee was very hostile to it. And they took care to make sure that the members of the CEDAW committee who questioned the delegation about it were all from Muslim majority countries. Uh, and they were, but they were very critical and very unwilling to accept any alternative view that perhaps medicalization might, and a lesser form of cutting might be an acceptable compromise in that particular cultural scenario. So, I mean, these these are really tough issues and my students always debate them and <laughs> get very upset about them. But I, I do accept that um, there's a lot of literature about cultural practices and whether the CEDAW committee sometimes doesn't take into account the need for cultural sensitivity. I don't have an answer to it, I'm afraid. 